So I am starting. Okay. We have a quiz coming. So please don't be scared. So I'm teasing you. It won't be harder. Then it will be harder because it's a different material. So for me, it's harder because I really hate Latin names. I really, really hate it. Uh, but I have class because that's what it is in curriculum. So don't like just because of that to me it's harder. But generally, I you saw first quiz and you saw it's not hard. So everything what is in review will be on quiz. Not no hidden intentions. Nothing. I, my 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 goal is not to mess with your marks. I do want you to get, you get good marks. That means that I taught you well. So that that's all what I need. But I do need you to know. So I really want you to understand my that that's that's all point of the class. So um, whatever we talk today with this very 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 short lecture about. Um, evolution of life at higher temperature and this amazing hydrogen metabolism and this is a hack enzyme. This is not going to be on the quiz. It will be on midterm, but it won't be on quiz. So uh, the quiz will be uh, cut off is the lecture 13. Uh, and the two, there is a review posted. I corrected that uh, little thing with Kaolobacter that I realized it might be confusing. Uh, it is confusing. It was confusing for me, but when I did additional search, it is alpha cytobacterium, but it's quite closely related to the other one. And I corrected that so you guys don't get confused. Uh, and in systematics, very often uh, things get reclassified, classified. It's, to me, it's very complicated. I, I'm not systematic, I'm not systematic biologist, so I have never done anything like that. So I can't really speak for my colleague. But anyway, um, we will go to that review. Uh, and I will try maybe to go to both reviews. I don't, I cannot promise because there are units um, three and four. So maybe we won't have enough time, but I will do my best. You still have lectures, so it's fine. Uh, any questions before we move on? All good? Okay. So today's lecture is going to be about evolution of life at high temperatures. And this is just extension from what we learned uh, about bacterial files. So this is the lecture that um, I, I imported it only because I, uh, while I was searching the literature, uh, I ran into this paper from 2023. And it was actually the same time when I finished um, lectures for uh, hyperthermophilic organisms, Acutex, Thermotoga, and Thermobacterium. And I was like, wow, this is magnificent. Like, how is this possible? And then I started reading and I asked my boss, and she was like, oh, oh, okay, this is interesting. And, and I was like, okay, I have to make this a lecture, but I um, I want to make it a fun lecture because it's interest, it's inter something that was recently found that it's interesting. And you can find these things only if you have such fantastic equipment, which those guys apparently have. Uh, and it tells us a lot about um, uh, basic evolution of life, which definitely happened at high temperature because, as we know, Earth origin Earth was in um, hot. And um, again, before I move, I want really you to come on November second for the guest lecture. So I am still thinking how to give a word to the people who show up because there will be guest lecture and there will be some sort of points awarded for people who come because um, Dr. Kurt Kornhauser will talk about um, evolution of uh, cyanobacteria and big oxygenation event from geological perspective and he will talk about Van Geyer formation and I saw lecture yesterday it's absolutely brilliant uh, and he is an expert in his uh, his geologist from Earth and Atmospheric right. Sciences, so he knows uh, those things that I don't, like the chemistry of Earth, uh, how microbes interacted with the available metals. I know that I have a very limited amount of knowledge in chemistry. I know a lot about microbial physiology and response, but uh, the chemistry and everything that was happening in that in, in that part of the before and after oxygenation event, especially when uh, cyanobacteria evolved, I I know from microbial perspective. He knows from, in my opinion, more important perspective, and that's why some uh, earth science. And um, 
it, I, I think he's way bigger expert than I am. So it would be really useful if you come. And I still didn't figure out, I will tell more to, to figure out she had good ideas about how to take and add points. And she's pretty strict. So I will tell her to figure out that I can't, I'm, I'm easy boy. So yeah. Anyway, so. Um, How evolved, so what happened uh, in early Earth when there was a hot temperature and when hydrogen was above? So we have a brief recap of when last universal common ancestor appeared. So it was 4 billion years ago. So initially Earth showed up, Earth uh, arise, arose at 4.5 billion years ago, Luke appeared at 4 billion years ago. Now, what do we know about Luca is that it must be Tennessee, because as we know, Earth was hot. So definitely the one that gave a rise to bacteria, Archaea, and later on Archaea, Archaea settled into a eukaryote, that one definitely was Tennessee. Now, think about that in next 100 million years, temperature was very high, which means that whatever lived then had to be thermophilic. So we talked about aquifers, we talked about thermophilia, we talked about thermophilia, we talked about thermophilia, we talked about thermophilia. So, but those were all bacteria. You will see when we talk, start talking about that here, almost all, most of them are uh, hyperthermophilic, which means, and, and we know that aquifex, which is bacteria, actually took a tons of genes from archaea, so like ten of them. So um, both bacteria and archaea can be hyperthermophilic. Both of them can grow at high temperatures. Archaea are definitely much better, but there are bacteria, as you could see, those bacteria that are located very near to the bottom of um, uh, common, universal phylogenetic tree. They, that, that tells you that Luca had to be also thermophilic. Now, um, how they can grow at such a high temperature? So we know that most of the proteins denaturate uh, after 40 degrees or 60, but these organisms actually live literally the edge of life, like over 100 degrees Celsius. But the way how they can do in this extremely high temperature is thanks to the uh, extreme adaptations that, that that help them to survive and to cope with um, this, this, this conditions that other organisms cannot. Um, where will you see these um, uh, hyperthermo hyperthermophilic conditions? Well, in hot springs, uh, like more than 100 degrees water vents at the ocean floor. Um, super hot water, the one that is like 150 degrees, that one does not have water microorganisms. And you will see later, uh, basic molecules like ATP degrade at 150 degrees, so you can have life. Uh, for now, I believe that recorder is the uh, organism that lives at 113 degrees, which is fantastic. That's way more than so, oh, actually, I was wrong. It actually grows at 122. I thought it's 113. Uh, what could be that the paper says 113, and then I found it's 122. So, 122, that's a lot. That's out of class. That's like a huge amount. It's, it's really in. So, the, the, the question there is like, how much this methanovirus actually is able to live at 120, like that's above boiling of water. So, what's happening? So, um, the way how they, so um, again those over 250 there is not there are no molecules because the ATP is degraded at 150. So I would say that the cut off is 122. Uh, one somewhere I found 113, but apparently can be 100. How how is that possible? Well, it's possible because of molecular adaptation. And this is adaptation. Term. So if you remember, we talked about, uh, last uh, class, we talked about the Enococcus radiodurans. And the way how this guy actually can stand 5,000 grays <laughs> is because uh, whatever mutation is caused by radiation, they evolve fantastic repair system that fixed double strand break. So the same happens here, similar happens here. So they, uh, they, evolve, they develop all these adaptations like thermostable proteins, thermosomes, like collection of therm like uh, collection of thermostable proteins, uh, chaperonins, proteins that actually um, correct folding of proteins. This reverse DNA G-rays, 
which I will talk about later, is a big deal for um, high temperature, and uh, mostly RNA modification. And all of these modifications are actually uh, helping them to maintain stability of main macromolecules like DNA and proteins at high temperatures. So in terms of thermosomes, they keep proteins uh, properly folded. So that's one adaptation. So in proteins, they can function at high temperature. So it's similar like a chaperon, but so I think it folds more, it catches more proteins. So also thermosome can maintain DNA. So it's a structure, it's a separate structure. Uh, so the thing is that uh, the, the DNA that survives in thermosomes when cells are returned to the optimal or lower temperature, uh, DNA is able to, 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 to continue replicating the device. So thermosome is one other solution. Thermostable proteins are probably the most common. They do have specific folding. So it is not about specific amino acids in those thermostable proteins. It's mostly uh, due to specific folding. Um, does somebody know what are specific foldings of protein. What are three, or let's say four structures? Three structures of protein folding. Anyone took biochemistry? Yes, but what, are pro what is secondary structure? What are two, four, actually three forms of secondary structure? Exactly, and loop, loop. I don't know, when somebody says loop, but yeah, alpha and beta, alpha helix, beta sheet are most important. So, um, and this is hard to predict. Um, my literature that I search doesn't really, there is no really pattern, but some, some papers suggest that thermostable proteins have more alpha helical structure than beta sheet. But it's not universal, that's my point. So this is just, you have to do consolidation anyways. They do have a hydrophobic core. Like, so that uh, hydrophobic core means that uh, protein that prevents prevents proteins to un uh, so if if cell if uh, if core is full of hydrophilic amino acid, it will get in touch with water and it can unfold, like unpack. When something is hydrophobic, they tend to stuck together and then it's harder to uh, break down that structure. Um, uh, ionic interaction on the surface are higher. Was a specific um, and all with the purpose to prevent protein fold, pro protein default. So, uh, chaperonins are key shock proteins. So you probably all heard about that. They are quite important for my uh, microbiology and for microbial world. They participate in all sorts of things, uh, but here they participate in protein refolding when they get denaturated. So it's like a protein repair. Uh, the next one is actually reverse DNA DNAs, which is a big deal for thermostable proteins. Uh, so, in addition to proteins, uh, evolution, so the, the molecule that must be stable at high temperature is DNA as well. So, what will happen in those uh, thermo adapted, ther thermo, sorry thermophilic, so not thermoadapted, thermophilic organisms. What's the difference between thermoadapted and thermophilic? Yes. So philic refers to the bacteria or microbes physically loving the environment and eating those conditions to live with them. Adapted physically means something. Uh, like I said, adapted. So it's not well suited for it, but it does have the necessary tools to live with them. That exactly. So adapted means that somebody learned how to deal with it. So I am adapted to cold weather. I did not evolve to live here. I evolved to live on Hawaii, believe me. Or something nice on the country, somewhere very uh, but, but I am adapted because my job is here. So I have adaptations. Now I can walk around in short sleeves. I would still thrive in Hawaii. I don't like being here. Uh, so just example, like you. Uh, anyway, so um, thank you, thank you, Ewan. Uh, so 
what happens how you how you how you facilitate dna and rna nucleic acid stability so cell is uh, importing potassium potassium prevents dna from melting so then this is important to state on that too. Uh, this dna what is dna gerase i mean it says here but you want okay that is so that is in the specific email specific and transistors for supercoding yeah, it's present in most bacteria. But what this one does, so uh, the GRAs introduce positive supercoils, uh, this reverse one. Usually, DNA has, so GRAs introduce negative supercoils. So what is supercoiling? So when you have DNA molecules, so like you can, I don't have here the, the, the hair band, the elastic hair band, and then we do literally do like a super like this. So that's how DNA gets packed. So usually it's negative, and that's done by normal DNA gerase. This one is reversed. So it, um, it introduces positive supercoils, and that actually stabilizes DNA, so prevents it from unwinding. There are highly basic DNA binding proteins. So what means highly basic? Which amino acids it must have if it's highly basic? Uh-huh. Lysine. Highly basic, yeah. Arginine, lysine, so yeah, those are the most important. Yeah, this is the new one. So highly basic amino acids. So the, the, the that's pretty much that's the point. So we bind DNA. Which amino acids would be in DNA binding proteins generally? What's the charge of DNA? Come on, th third year of uh, third. You are third year. What's the basic charge of this molecule? Negative. So what's the charge of proteins that bind to? That's it. Good. And heat resistant lipid, something that will survive melting. Usually we have that through these ether bonds in Arcea. If you remember, we talked about um, uh, differences um, uh, between bacterial and arcial lipids. So bacteria have ester bond between glycerol and the fatty acid side chain. While Arcea have ether bond, and instead of fatty acid, they have that isoclean, which is really highly compact molecule because that gives that stability uh, in cellular membrane, so they can survive. Um, we are still at nucleic acid, so uh, ribosomal RNA is a big important molecule. You know the key one that started everything RNA world. So uh, and Apparently, it, in thermophilic organisms, there is a higher per, uh, percentage of GC pairs. Why would that be? Why are GC pairs better than AC pairs? Exactly. Exactly. Great. What's your name? Sorry. Katya Bridge. Yeah, so GC. Yes, you want? I think it should also have to look at it. That's because. When you look at like uh, adenine, adenine and thymine, hydrogen bonds, there's only two. In the case of guanine and cytosine, there's three hydrogen bonds. Yes, that's what Katya, yeah. And that's that small difference is why, that small difference makes up why it's more stable. Exactly, exactly. Funny story when I did this tattoo, oh God. The guy who was doing it had no clue what that is. For him, that was just some weird drawing, and then initially added two bonds between J and C, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, no, you're all done. And I think the funny thing is that my cousin who was like, was like, he knows it. <laughs> all done, not done. And I was like, no, he was like, dude, now she will give us a lecture. So why? Like, why? Why did you have to miss it? You just look at the picture, three lines, three lines. That's all that you need to memorize. So it, it was funny. So he actually, no, for me, this is not Latin. I was like, no, they are not Latin. It has meaning. <laughs> just like he hates me from the deepness of his soul, but I don't care. He learned what DNA is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, time story. So, yes, GC, important. Three bonds. Now, what was, so when we talk about microbial evolution, so again, hypothesis, uh, everything happened on the ocean floor, um, from everything arose from hydrothermal springs. Uh, so, phylogeny, 
so of modern uh, thermophiles like phylogenetic trees so that's in the bottom of the tree and um, pretty much uh, suggest that those so those thermophilic organisms that are on the bottom of phylogenetic tree like archaea like aquifer so uh, the their phylogeny 16s rna shows that they are actually very closely they, they must be closely related to the luca because they they, they just evolved to be on the high temperature and initially it was very hard high now uh, what that why that matters well when we talk about um hydrogen as an energy source we know it's highly reduced and probably that was the first energy source present on earth and we know that these days you don't might don't leave fossils so we can't really say that that was true like there's no dinosaurs that you can dig you can only do educated guessing but quite good because do we we today know that there are organisms that can oxidize hydrogen and reduce iron sulfur and nitrate all like especially iron sulfate sulfur that was all abundant in early earth so and in all thermophiles, you will see ability to oxidize that hydrogen, like the primary um, energy source. So, because we know now that uh, hyperthermophiles were on the bottom of phylogenetic tree, so we know that they evolved early, and we also know that they can use hydrogen. So, and we know that hydrogen apparently was there. So, because we because of that connection, we become aware that hydrogen must be very important as an energy source, and it was very important for evolution of life. It was available, which is great, it was abundant, so whoever learned how to use it would try. And it evolved, primary, of course, in primary organisms first. So who can live at high temperature? Chemolithotrophs. Only that. Chemoorganotrophs which means oxidation of organic compounds, can go up to 110, cannot go more. Even then, it's not great. Photosynthesis is probably the least tolerant, only 73 degree degrees. Like the photosynthesis doesn't really like hot, hot temperature. So that, again, can tell you that based on the Earth development, you can actually... Uh, structure how like the time time course of each organism development. But fascinating bacteria that are main topic here and we kind of covered many of them are those hydrogen metabolizing bacteria. Interesting are those guys that can actually respire oxygen. So they must be must be that they somehow evolved after like after cyan, they, they evolved at the same time as cyanobacteria, so there must be some oxygen there. And they use hydrogen as a dog. And they can fix, of course, carbon dioxide. How they do that? Hydrogen is there. Bind hydrogen, oxidize kind hydrogen, respire oxygen, it has to be present nickel. Why nickel? That's why it's important. We talked about those um, enzymes that were abundant on early earth and which cofactors were needed. So nickel was there, and definitely nickel is important for hydrogen. And so that's why we know it was there in um, earlier. What do we actually know today? So we know that there are diverse atmospheric bacteria that can use hydrogen to survive. And we know that hydrogen oxidation is a significant process, um, especially uh, nowadays when hydrogen uh, is uh, one of alternative fuels, mm -hmm. the great fuel. So apparently this, this really matters. So it's important to understand bacteria that can actually extract electrons from hydrogen. And this, the hydrogen oxidation actually, actually uh, regulated uh, composition of the atmosphere and uh, it helped in the diversity generally in soil and in water. And it is one of the primary productions in extreme environments because it, that, that, that molecule was highly abundant. But how do you extract energy from hydrogen? Like, must be some enzyme, yes, it's uh, nitrogenase, but What's the structural base? Like how, how actually nitrogen is done? So atmospheric hydrogen oxidation is kind of hard to happen. That means like here now, like is how it has to be a huge amount of hydrogen to be able to get um, hydrogen oxidation. But 
They, they found that there is uncharacterized member of hydrogenase that produce two cofactors, nickel and iron, from that super family. And it was very unclear. It was unclear metabolism. So what this enzyme would have to do is to have high affinity for atmospheric hydrogen. That means it has to detect every single level of atmospheric hydrogen and oxygen and to balance those two to be able to produce energy. So how would that enzyme be able to do it? So before this paper, what was known that there are um, two, there, uh, there, are, there are certain types of hydrogen oxidizing enzymes uh, that are membrane bound and they have low affinity for hydrogen. So if it has low affinity for hydrogen, that means that this enzyme could only function when there is like a tons of hydrogen. Now we don't have that. So uh, this, this enzyme uh, of hydrogen is with low, low affinity for hydrogen, hydrogen could not support hydrogen oxidation, atmospheric hydrogen oxidation, plus oxygen poisoning. So it wasn't really oxygen test. But these guys from Ginter and I told in 2023, they found this mycobacterium that actually discovered, so they discovered a group of hydrogen, which is also nickel iron, so pretty much the same cofactors, but it can, it has high affinity for hydrogen. It literally catches the teeny tiny amounts that are impossible to be caught with any other enzyme, and it brings it to electron transport chain, plus doesn't care about oxygen. It's completely insensitive to oxygen. And luckily, they actually had uh, prior electronic microscopy. So they were able to isolate this uh, mycobacterium uh, organism and to, to, to extract proteins and do crystallization of this uh, novel enzyme, which is now named HUK, H-U-K. Very unique recently discovered enzyme that actually can take with like small, teeny tiny amounts of hydrogen in the atmosphere and oxidize it. It has multiple methyl clusters, great, uh, and it is apparently stable at pretty much all temperatures. And it was able to actually detect hydrogen so much, to, to, it was able to oxidize hydrogen so much that they could not detect, like literally below detection level of chromatography. So that literally means whatever of hydrogen is there, regardless of how small amount is, this one will be able to generate um, to generate um, energy. And this is how enzyme actually looks. So this is just um, this is just a schematic picture. When you do crystallization, it looks way more cool. Uh, this is just some drawing. It literally looks like my child was playing, but but it makes sense for me. It's easier to get. My brain doesn't really function at the end of the day. So it looks like a four-leaf four flower, and uh, there are many membrane vesicles and cell-like protrusions. Um, and activity is mainly associated with soluble fraction because the one portion is actually associated with membrane. So it's a membrane enzyme. So it's very, very specific hack enzyme. And they described it, it like a few months ago, literally, actually during summer, uh, as oxygen tolerant hydrogenase. And um, what that means that uh, oxygen amount is much higher than hydrogen in the atmosphere. So um, it was pretty unlikely that hydrogen oxidation can actually keep those two dimers sufficiently reduced to displace bound oxygen. So what that means. So this is the, usually these hydrogenases are oxygen sensitive. So this one was not. Oxygen doesn't do anything to it. So, uh, but there is so much oxygen, so much more oxygen in atmosphere compared to hydrogen. So what is the mechanism for oxygen protection? So there must be some enzyme. So it wasn't definitely speed of oxidation. So if that speed of oxidation couldn't displace it. They did some measurements in paper. So what they found is that this enzyme actually has a gas channels. And what those channels do, they literally, let, they, they provide, a, a, they open and provide a pathway only specifically to hydrogen. It's like a, a road to the active sites. 
sites. So it's like a literally only single one, one single test for only one molecule that they will oxidize. It's called bottleneck. Now, uh, these gas channels that provide hydrogen entrance, uh, they're much more narrow in fact than um, than uh, than in those other hydrogenates that are oxygen tolerant or sensitive. So this narrow bottleneck uh, is actually the road to the active site. Now, hydrogen enters through those very, very narrow channels, uh, but oxygen is excluded. So it kind of selectively gets rid, gets rid, gets rid of oxygen. So it's a, a, another adaptation that helps them to survive uh, to, to, to extract everything from hydrogen. And it happens this present at low temperatures as well. And this is pretty much all from this lecture. There is nothing more about that. Uh, we will move to the review. This was mostly for me to tell you the story about the, the, the amazing enzyme that they discovered uh, that evolved at high temperature. And it was quite different. It has very unique mechanism. And I was literally impressed. Any questions before we move to the review? Because we have more than enough time. Yes, you want to more than that question. I have to come because I didn't ever forget that. Please cover the videos. Yes, they actually talk very specifically about the pathway of hydrogen to get up. But I, I didn't really want to talk about this because I think the same thing starts from one of the like class. Okay, but I, I will post papers so who wants you can read it. It's quite new paper and I am I was impressed. Any questions? I will uh, stop uh, recording.